Well, I hope that that's um, been about five minutes and people are, uh, are, are back at their um, at their screens, uh, ready now for our next speaker, who I have uh, great pleasure in uh, introduce, introducing. It's Lucy Briggs. And she was recently described as a charming assassin, no nonsense, and an excellent advocate. And she's going to speak to us about the fire regulations and having litigation and the landscape post Grenfell. Okay, um, so uh, good afternoon to everyone out there in the virtual world. Um, as you can hopefully see from my slides, um, I'm going to be speaking today about fire regulation and cladding litigation, and in particular, the legal uh, and regulatory landscape uh, following the Grenfell fire, which happened on the 14th of June, 2017. Now, I've been giving uh, talks on this topic since 2019, and over the time, uh, this subject has increased in breadth. So new regulatory controls have been brought in. Um, the Grenfell Inquiry obviously has been progressing. Uh, government funding schemes have been coming online. And of course, there have been an increasing number of cases that have been uh, coming through the courts arising out of cladding uh, claims. Although, as I'll come on to, we have yet to see a full cladding case go through trial in this jurisdiction. Um, but whilst the uh, topic has become much broader, unfortunately, my time slot for speaking about it hasn't. So what I'm going to try to do today is give uh, you all a very broad overview of um, the various aspects of the uh, legal and regulatory landscape um, in the next 40 minutes. Uh, some matters I might have to skip over quite quickly, um, but I've put a lot of content in the slides and I understand that they will be made available after the talk. So the first few slides that I'm going to show you, I think quite vividly illustrate why building regulations relating to the cladding of high rise buildings have become such a major issue. Um, these slides show the timeline of the Grenfell fire um, and they illustrate quite horrifically the speed with which the fire spread over the external surfaces of the Grenfell tower. Uh, and they, that happened in a way that should not have been possible if the cladding had complied with the building regulations that were in force at that time. So today I'm going to start by talking about those building regulations. Uh, I'm going to look at how they've evolved since the Grenfell fire and how the evolution of the regulations can inform us as lawyers potentially looking to either prosecute or defend um, the various contractors and building professionals involved. Um, I'll then be looking at, uh, at who is uh, possibly on the hook for the remedial costs and the ways in which that liability might be pursued. And then finally, I'll uh, give a brief run through of some of the cases that uh, arise out of defective cladding that have passed through the courts so far, uh, which have dealt with a range of interesting legal issues such as limitation and insurance um, claims. And finally, I will look at a cladding case um, from another jurisdiction that has made it through a full trial. Um, so if I start with the legislative uh, background, uh, there's a lot to get through. Um, it's a bit of a whistle-stop tour. The slides will set out the detail and the sources. So if you are involved in the cladding litigation, I'll hopefully point you in the direction of the documents you'll need to uh, be looking at. So the top tier of legislation, relevant legislation, is the Building Act 1984. Um, but the, the really relevant bit of legislation are the Building Regulations 2010. And these slides show the building regulations as they were at the time of Grenfell. So uh, paragraph 41A of the 2010 regulations require that building works are carried out so that they comply with the applicable functional requirements that are set out in Schedule 1. And you'll see on that slide two of the functional requirements, B34 and B33, uh, which deal with the spread of fire and smoke in concealed spaces and internally. But the key provision for the purpose of looking at the combustibility of external cladding is B41 of Schedule 1, and that's on the slide. Now, just pausing there for a second, the concept of functional requirements as opposed to prescriptive requirements uh, is something which appeared uh, in 1984 with the Building Act. Um, and it arose out of the push for deregulation during the Thatcher years. So since then, we've had functional as opposed to prescriptive requirements. And these functional requirements have then had approved documents uh, sitting beneath them that provide guidance on how to achieve the functional requirements. And as I say, the key one uh, when you're considering a cladding claim is B41. Uh, 
um, that provides that external walls of a building shall adequately resist the spread of fire over the walls and from one building to another, having regard to the height, use and position of the building. And B42, which you'll see underneath, says effectively the same thing in relation to the roof. So given that these are functional requirements and they're not prescriptive, there's a few things to note. Uh, within the regulations themselves, um, they do not tell you how you must achieve that functional requirement. The wording in bold there is, is literally all you get given. Um, so that is just a result you have to achieve. Looking at the drafting of that, uh, various in, uh, issues might become relevant, I think, in, in any litigation which, in which um, whether something has met that requirement is considered. So, for example, the term adequately isn't defined. There's potentially a caveat to that, saying that it's adequately having regard to the height, use and position of the building. So a question that we'll come on to look at later is how will compliance with that regulation be judged? Uh, importantly, how might compliance or non-compliance with that be determined by the court? Now, in terms of how you meet the functional requirements, Section 6 of the Building Act uh, provides for the publication by the Secretary of State of documents providing practical guidance with respect to meeting uh, the requirements of the building regs. And that's in a series of approved documents that are issued by the Secretary of State. Now, approved document B, ADB, is the relevant document for fire safety. Um, now, as I've said, amendments have been made post Grenfell, and we'll come on to those, but these slides set out um, the provisions of approved document B as they were at the time of Grenfell. So if we look at the final bullet point there, the approved documents are intended to provide guidance for some of the more common building situations, but there might be alternative ways of achieving compliance with the requirements. And importantly, there's no obligation to adopt any particular solution contained in an approved document if you prefer to meet the requirement in, other, in some other way. So it's made very clear that these are guidance documents only, they're not prescriptive. Uh, but having said that, the way that these documents were approached, certainly prior to Grenfell, uh, and certainly by those in the industry using them to design buildings, was that if they were followed, they could be expected to result in compliance with the building regulations. Now, uh, this slide is a quote from literally the first few paragraphs of the introductory section of approved document B headed performance. And what I want to highlight here really is the bit at the bottom. Uh, when you read approved document B in its form prior to Grenfell, the focus of it does seem very much to have been on the spread of fire from building to building, rather than on the spread of fire on the external facade of the building itself. And that's something which has changed since. So as I say, there have been changes uh, to various bits of legislation and guidance since Grenfell. I've listed some of them on the slides. Um, now, if you are involved in a cladding case, I think it's very interesting, uh, particularly if you're involved in um, a case involving a professional with a reasonable skill and care obligation, it's interesting to consider uh, potential defences uh, your clients might have of having complied with guidance at the time. And I think to do that, looking at the changes that have been made since Grenfell is quite instructive. I think these changes are quite telling in terms of potential weaknesses and lack of clarity in the old version of um, ADB and the guidance. And I think it's, it's acknowledged even now that more changes are needed. So going back one slide, um, one of the changes in the new version is that the first narrative section headed intention jumps straight, straight into a new provision that is headed resisting fire spread over external walls. So there's a whole separate section about fire spread over external walls, and then there's a separate section about the spread of fire between buildings. So I think that really affirms the point that the, pri the previous version of ADP, ADB was um, really focusing more on the spread between buildings. So if we look at this, this is the, the old version of ADB. And there are several paragraphs which focus on the spread between buildings before you get to 12.5, which is the bit that looks at spread over, over the walls of a building itself. Now, the first bit that's highlighted there, if you look at the first sentence, uh, that potentially gives some indication 
about how the word adequacy, adequate in B41 or adequately might be judged. Because you can see there, um, there's very much a focus on whether there's likely to be a risk of health and safety. So the concern of B41, certainly if you look at the, the guidance sitting beneath it, is arguably with a reasonable standard of life safety as opposed to a requirement for property protection. Now, the second part of that is highlighted. That gives you two options for how you might want to meet the um, functional requirement B41. So you can either follow the guidance in paragraph 12.6 to 12.9 of ADB, or you can do a test, a BS8414 test, as it's referred to. Um, so if we look at the second option first, the testing option. So uh, this is the testing option. So BS8414 is a large scale system test where you basically build the cladding system and you mimic a fire breaking out of a window and exposing it to a severe fire. And that test is assessed against performance criteria in BR135. Um, now it's important to note that the classification you get from that only applies to the specific external facade system that's being tested. And this is one of the things that has caused issues post Grenfell in the rush for everyone trying to get systems tested is the extent to which, and there've been arguments in several cases um, about the extent to which the test system needs to actually mirror the actual existing facade of the building that's being tested. And as a result of some of these difficulties, um, in September 2019, the British Standards Institute came up with a new standard, BS 9414, which is to be used in conjunction with BS 8414. And what BS 9414 does is it defines what is allowed to change between the test system and the, the setup in real life on the building. So that's the testing route. You do a mock-up, you set it alight, you observe it against the criteria in BR135. So that was one of the options to um, make sure you comply with B41. But going back a slide, uh, the first option that was given was you can comply with the guidance in paragraphs 12.6 to 12.9 of ADB. So if we look at that, this is uh, paragraphs 12 points, uh, this is in the ADB at paragraph 12.6. And it's a diagram that sets out um, the type of materials you need to use on particular surfaces, depending on where they are. So where there's white surfaces, there are no provisions. Uh, light gray, you have to meet certain classification of materials and dark gray, you have to meet a higher classification. But again, you can see there is a lot of focus in this diagram on proximity uh, to other buildings. Now that the key provisions between 12.6 and, and 12.9, the key one really is 12.7. So in a building with a story 18 metres or more above ground, any insulation product, filler material, et cetera, should be of limited combustibility. And there's an appendix which, which sets out uh, those materials. Now, this is telling you effectively, if, if you stick to the materials in appendix A, your cladding should comply with B41. Now, pausing here again, there is a potentially important comparison to be made with the new version of approved document B. In the new version, that paragraph at 12.7 has been amended to say any insulation product, filler material, brackets, such as the core materials of metal composite panels, etc. So it's, it's the new version defines what is meant by filler material. It also provides more stringent requirements as to the, to the class of materials that can be used generally. But the reason for the clarification in relation to the use of filler material is that immediately post Grenfell, the government said, well, the reference to filler in the old version of ADB was always intended to refer to the core of an ACM sheet. So an ACM uh, sheet with a combustible core was never allowed. However, that does not appear to have been the industry's understanding uh, of what ADB uh, meant in the 50 or years, 50 years or so that ACM has been around. Um, Dr. Barbara Lane, when she gave evidence to the Grenfell inquiry, echoed the understanding in the construction and composites industry that filler had not been a term that was used to define the core material of an ACM panel. She basically said that if 
what that provision really meant was that the core needed to be of limited combustibility, then there would be evidence that people such as certifiers, building control, fire engineers had been historically asking for core of limited combustibility and had been testing it. And she said she'd never heard of that requirement or of any such testing until after Grenfell. So I think there we have an example of what I would put neutrally as a lack of clarity in the old guidance document. And we have an example of a body of practice that has built up and grown around it that may then have some relevance when we come on to talk about potential liability and negligence later on. And the potential for an argument by a, a construction professional that they were acting in accordance with a relevant body of practice in the industry when they specified a material that did not have a core of limited combustibility. So I think the fact it was clarified in the amended version is perhaps probative when it comes to looking at standard industry practice or understanding pre-Grenfell. Um, so <clears throat> basically those are the provisions. So that's the set, that's the, the option in ADB. You either do the test or you follow uh, these uh, guidance principles. But that's not quite the end of the story um, because guidance in respect of compliance with B41 was also provided by the Building Control Alliance in a document called TGN18. It's technical guidance note 18 and that was issued in June 2014 and updated in June 2015, so again pre-Grenfell. Uh, the BCA is basically an industry body uh, involved in building control. And that's a document, again, that was widely used and was thought in the industry to reflect good practice in ascertaining compliance with B41. And TGN 18 gives four options uh, for ways you can comply with B41. Uh, option one and two basically reflect the same as approved document B. So use materials of limited combustibility or do the test. Um, the bit highlighted just, just highlights the fact that the, the BS8414 tests aren't a pass or fail criteria. They're assessed against a certain set of criteria. And again, that might be relevant when it comes on later to looking at whether even if something fails, a, BR, uh, a, a BS8414 test against BR135, whether there still might be arguments about compliance or non-compliance. But what's interesting about the TGN notice, it gives two more options uh, for how you might want to go about complying with B41. The first, uh, and those arguably don't, uh, don't mirror what's in um, approved document B. Uh, the first is you could do a desktop study. And the second is you can do a fire engineering approach. Um, now, for, for obvious reasons, both of these, and particularly the desktop top study was uh, fairly popular prior to Grenfell. Uh, because contractors were often not using only materials of low combustibility as listed in Appendix A, so they couldn't go option one. Uh, the testing is expensive and time consuming, so they would follow option three or option four. Um, I think uh, certainly option three, the desktop study, has been almost entirely jettisoned now by the industry. But again, that raises an interesting question. If an architect or engineer followed that guidance, option three or option four, but the result with hindsight is not compliant with the uh, B41. Uh, for example, when you do a, a full test, um, a mock-up under BS8414, where does that leave the professional in question? Um, because we now know with hindsight that following these, rule, uh, these routes uh, does not guarantee a compliant result. And I think at this point, it's probably interesting to look at what the Building Act says about compliance with the guidance. It says a failure on the part of a person to comply with the approved document does not itself render him liable to civil or criminal proceedings, but a failure to comply uh, may be relied on as tending to establish liability and proof of compliance may be relied on as tending to negative liability. Um, what does that mean in legal terms, tending to? It's not a, a term that we often come across. Um, I think there'll be inevitably a debate about what it means. Does it create even so much as a rebuttable presumption? Does it go that far? Uh, but as I said, certainly within the industry, it was always thought prior to Grenfell that if you complied with the guidance, whether it be an approved document B or TGN 18, not only would you have fulfilled your professional obligations, but you would end up with a safe building. And of course, we now know that at least in relation to the latter, 
that is certainly not the case. So hopefully that has given uh, you some background as to how and why we might have ended up with so many non-compliant buildings, the lack of clarity in the relevant legislation and guidance and a body of practice that built up as a result of it. Um, and as I've said, there have been amendments to approve document B. So if you're doing a cladding case, it's very much worth going through these changes. Um, and as I've tried to demonstrate using a couple of them, they can tell you something about the lack of clarity or the holes in the previous guidance. So now to move on and look at how will the courts deal with uh, ascertaining whether there has in fact been a breach of B41. Um, now the first thing uh, is to address the question, has the functional requirement been met or has it not been met? And how will the court assess that? Well, obviously, in one sense, it'll depend on whether you're in a live fire situation or not. In terms of a live fire situation, um, we have had some findings from Grenfell that were relevant. Um, the question of compliance with the building regs was not supposed to be part of part one of the inquiry, but Sir Martin Morbick was prevailed upon to make some limited findings. And he said, basically, that it is self-evident that the cladding in the Grenfell case did not comply with B41. And I think in a live fire situation, which hopefully will be very rare, uh, that is, is obviously the right approach. But how will the court assess it in non-live fire situations? So in all of the civil claims that are now being made because of uh, non or potentially non-compliant cladding. So in absence of a live fire, the most likely route for the parties to establish whether cladding complies with B41 is the testing route. So doing a full scale BS8414 test. And the results of that uh, can then be used to inform the court as to whether BS, uh, B41 has been met. But again, we've got a few relevant findings uh, from Grenfell. Uh, the first quote, I think, uh, shows an indication that uh, compliance with B41 uh, will be judged on its own merits. And the fact that uh, the people involved or what was used uh, followed the guidance in the approved document B will not result in a finding of deemed compliance. It will be judged on its own merits. And the final quote, uh, again, saying it's not just the materials that will be looked at, but the way in which they've been used, so the design, the geometry, and that's relevant to the discussion we had earlier about um, making sure the mock-up that is used truly reflects the, um, the real life situation on the building, or well, that is, is something that could be open for argument in court by the parties. So uh, the main route, I think, to judging uh, if cladding system complies is likely to be the, the testing route. And certainly that is how the government have been um, assessing whether various cladding uh, uh, systems do or do not comply for the purposes of, of the various grants. But even if testing is done, as I've said, is there still going to be scope for an argument, uh, for expert testimony by the parties as to whether the results demonstrate or do not demonstrate uh, compliance with B41? Because as you recall, B41 says adequately resist the spread of fire having regard to height, use and position. And the proved document B at 12.5 says the external envelope of a building should not provide a medium for fire spread if it's likely to be a risk to health and safety. So that does suggest there might be an element of subjectivity. So if it sort of fails in inverted commas, the BS8414 uh, test when judged against BR135, but in relation to the building you're talking about, there wasn't actually a risk to health and safety. So, for example, there might have been other features such as sprinklers or fire escapes or the nature of the building might be that it wasn't residential. Um, would it still meet the functional requirements or would it not? But then you'll also recall in approved document B, it, it, it seemed to say that the external walls has to meet the guidance in 12.6 to 12.9 or the performance criteria in BR135. It has to pass that test. So um, there are some suggestions it might be an absolute, but some suggestions that, that, that it might not be. And that's certainly one thing which I'd anticipate may be argued about, um, you know, when one of these cases finally comes to court. As to how that would be resolved, um, I think, particularly in relation to the health and safety 
aspect, I think it could be quite forcefully argued if you had the right set of facts, you would need very strong facts. Um, but I think uh, it might be a brave judge uh, who would be willing to say uh, that, uh, you know, it's, you know, particularly if you have the sort of um, situation you had in Grenfell with that type of spread, that just because you had sprinklers and a good fire escapes and everyone would probably make it out alive, that your cladding system met B41. Um, however, I think depending on the facts, there may, there may be some room for argument. So the next uh, question, I suppose, is um, from whom can you get the costs of replacing defective cladding? Who can you sue? So we have a list there of potential parties. Um, now, owners, tenants and leaseholders, uh, traditionally, those might be seen as the potential claimants in these types of cases. But as we'll see in some of my slides later on, leaseholders certainly have been the source of recovery of costs for replacing cladding by a service charge provisions. Obviously, we have builders, subcontractors and cladding installers. So in relation to builders, contractors, building contracts obviously routinely contain warranties that you have to meet statutory requirements, you have to meet building regs, suitability of materials. And these will arguably be breached by non-compliance with B41, regardless of the use of reasonable skill and care. You would also have skill and care obligations in the contracts, possibly fitness for purpose obligations, uh, primarily, though, builders are going to be being sued only by those in direct contract with them, so probably not leaseholders. Um, possibly by third parties and leaseholders, if there's collateral warranties. Um, possible actions in tort, but I think as we've seen from Paul's talk, that, that's by no means going to be an easy route. Uh, and then we have the Defective Premises Act 1972, um, which I think is a better route for third parties. Builders are undoubtedly people taking on work for the construction of a dwelling. Um, so if it can be established that unsafe cladding renders a building unfit for habitation, there is a potential cause of action there, obviously subject to the six year limitation period unless it can be extended. Now, on the safety point, um, one of the authorities uh, on one of my latest slides, the uh, Zurich Authority, about an insurance claim, the court did in that case say that cladding that fails to meet B41 poses a present and imminent danger. Now, that was in the context of an insurance provision that, that required that. But it would seem to lend some support to the argument that uh, cladding that does not comply with B41 uh, could potentially render a dwelling unfit for habitation, but it's not a point that's been decided. Uh, you've got subcontractors cladding installers again um, absent collateral warranties they're likely to be brought in potentially on the hook via a claim passed down from a main contractor but again uh, there could be a direct cause of action under the defective premises act uh, you've got professionals again um, they may have similar contractual warranties as builders in their appointments but i think generally uh, reasonable skill and care requirements are perhaps more relevant when you come to uh, professional consultants Again, uh, the majority of the claims will be brought by parties that are in contract with them. Could be tortious claims, potentially, but again, not, not necessarily easily for the reasons that we saw in Paul's talk. Uh, they also may come under the provisions of the Defective Premises Act. Um, and we've looked at some of the factors that, that might come into play when you're talking about professionals with a reasonable skill and care obligation. And the fact that prior to Grenfell, an entire body of professionals were designing, approving and installing non-compliant cladding. Um, and so if you look at the usual test, which is falling below the standard of your competent peers, uh, that might be something, there might be something in that. Um, but on the other hand, is, is that type of defence really going to wash in the face of a clear non-compliance with the functional requirement, particularly in the current climate? Um, the source of ignition, that's there because of the case I'm going to look at, but it's only really relevant in a live fire situation. Building inspectors and proof inspectors, I'll come on to um, insurance and NHBC warranties. That's um, quite a popular route to recovery at the moment. And finally, we've got the government schemes, which I'll come on to. So just very briefly, um, in terms of tenants and leaseholders, as I've said, there have been cases, um, possibly somewhat surprising, that, that have allowed building owners to recover the cost of replacing defective cladding from their tenants and leaseholders under the service charges provisions in the leases. Um, and the tribunals that have heard those cases um, have uh, found that if uh, the service charge on a proper interpretation covers uh, 
uh, the replacement of cladding under the repairing or, or keeping in good repair um, provisions, then it is something that can be recovered from leaseholders. And as you'll see from the slides, which I won't go through in detail, but um, the tribunals have really said that whether morally it's right for an owner to be able to do that is not really any of their business. If the lease allows it, it is allowed. And the final bullet point in this case, um, the tribunals have, have said, well, you know, claims by tenants and leaseholders against, you know, contractors under insurance warranties, they might be speculative, expensive, take years to, 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 to come to fruition. But effectively, if the lease gives a right for it to be recovered under the service charge, it is recoverable. Um, and I'm going to come on to the fact that proposals have recently been made in, in Parliament to um, enact rules that will prohibit this road to recovery. But at the moment, it is one route that does seem to be followed successfully by uh, some owners to fund the replacement of cladding. So very briefly, building inspectors, approved inspectors, um, I think they're probably going to really be non-starters in terms of um, suing them for non-compliant cladding, at least unless you want to take the matter up to up to um, appeal. Uh, I've listed some recent authorities that have dealt with the potential liability of building inspectors and approved inspectors, not in the context of cladding, but that could be applied by analogy. So I think um, they're not as likely to be parties that are going to be um, successfully sued. Oops, sorry, uh, NHBC. Now, this is uh, a route that is being used um, successfully by uh, building owners or long lease holders for buildings that are covered by NHBC insurance and that are within time to make those claims. So you see that it applies in years three to ten. And I know that um, NHBC has been accepting claims under Section 4 of uh, the build mark um, and build mark choice policies in respect of cladding that has been found to not comply with B41. Um, you also have other insurance policies uh, outside of NHBC, and I've put a typical um, uh, uh, clause in an insurance policy there, which covers um, works, uh, repair replacement to works caused by present or imminent danger to the physical health and safety of the occupants. Um, now, uh, this has already been looked at uh, in the Zurich insurance case. That case was really actually focusing on um, a maximum liability clause and the proper construction of it. Uh, but what is interesting in this case is that um, it was found that the fire safety risks, um, and, and one of which is non-compliance with B41, were treated as posing a present and imminent danger to the residents. They did fall under the policy, uh, and but the, really the case was about how much could be recovered due to a maximum liability clause. Um, and then finally, uh, we have uh, government schemes, uh, which is increasingly becoming a route to recovery. Um, so the first scheme was uh, enacted in July 2019, uh, and that was a fund established by the government to support remediation of buildings which had unsafe ACM cladding, so the type that was on Grenfell. And it was specifically for the benefit of leaseholders in residential buildings that were over 18 metres in height. And that was a £600 million uh, fund. And as of April last year, the department had identified 456 buildings that came within the scope of that programme. Uh, and by then, so by April last year, 149 had been remediated using the scheme. Uh, there were 307 left to be remediated. Uh, and I think there was 167 which hadn't even started. And the pace of remediation has been obviously faster in a student accommodation and social housing, but they found it's been slower in the private sector. And obviously things have probably slowed down a bit due to COVID as well. But the current estimate is that all of the buildings within the scope of that scheme will be remediated by mid 2022. And in fact, 95% of them will be done by the end of this year. In March 2020, the government announced uh, a further 1 billion for the remediation of unsafe non-ACM cladding, but again on residential buildings of 18 metres and above, but both private and public housing sectors, and that opened in July last year. But interesting, the guidance for applying for both schemes makes it very clear that the government expects building owners and anyone who benefits from these schemes to actively identify and pursue all reasonable claims against those involved um, in the original cladding installation. 
and all warranty and insurance claims that might be uh, involved. And successful claims will then have to be paid back up into the scheme. But recently, the department running the scheme has acknowledged that it's only a minority of cases where that's it's going to be financially justifiable for building owners to do that um, because of legal costs, because of uncertainty, risk, and, and also because of limitation. And I think as of February last year, they'd only rec they'd recovered less than one million from the private sector and only about six and a half million from the public sector um, on the basis of that. And of course, um, there are still gaps where funding is not available from the government. So, for example, non-residential buildings. So take a hotel chain that has a, a, a tall building um, with non-compliant uh, cladding on it. Um, buy to let buildings that have no uh, resident leaseholders in them would not be covered. And buildings less than 18 metres are not covered. So, for example... Uh, the Cube, which was an accommodation block for University of Bolton students, and that caught fire in November 2019, that wasn't within any of the programmes. It was very narrowly below the 18 metre threshold, and it had um, high pressure laminate um, cladding on it. Uh, and its current estimates say that there, there are possibly around 85,000 buildings that are between 11 and 18 metres um, that may have uh, cladding systems that may be unsafe. Um, and an expert advisory panel has advised that some of the most dangerous forms of ACM cladding and insulation are unsafe on buildings of any height. So I think we can still expect litigation to arise out of the situation, both in relation to buildings that are covered by the fund, although perhaps less so, and certainly those that are excluded. There have been some recent developments as well. Um, as I said, in January this year, there was a proposed amendment to the Fire Safety Bill to prohibit owners from passing down costs of remedial works to deal with unsafe cladding to leaseholders. And in February, so very recently, there's a new 3.5 billion fund uh, being announced uh, and the details are on the slide. Now, very briefly, I want to just have a quick look at some of the cases that have come through the courts because of cladding litigation. So there's been a couple on limitation. Um, I won't go into detail, they're on the slide, but Sports City, which looked at um, extending the um, period of liability under the Defective Premises Act because of section 1.5, which states that if after completion, further work's done to rectify previous work, the cause of action in relation to that new work accrues at the time the further work's finished. And the court has said, well, that doesn't revive your cause of action in relation to the original work an RG Securities and Maskell, which was about a developer concealing the fact that a building uh, did not have building regulation approval and, and the courts said that arguably postpones the start of limitation, but they did say limitation is going to be fact sensitive. Now, as I said, we don't have, however, a full trial of cladding, uh, a cladding case in this jurisdiction to date. We do have a case in Australia that I think is very interesting though, which is Owners Corporation. And, and that was by the owners of a high-rise property, La Croix Apartment Towers, that had ACP cladding. And that had a fire on the 25th of November 14, started by a, a cigarette on a balcony. And a claim was brought by um, the building uh, uh, owners against, and, and leaseholders, against the builder and various other consultants, uh, including surveyor, architect and fire engineers, and against the individual that started the fire. Um, the, it was found that the rapid spread of fire was due to um, ACP uh, cladding with 100% polyethylene core. Now, um, prior to the case, it was widely anticipated that the contractor would be held most accountable for the highest proportion of the um, awards. But looking at what actually happened, the contractor was held to be in breach of warranty, but not, interestingly not, even though it was a DMB contract, not in breach of a duty to exercise reasonable skill and care because they had engaged professional consultants. Uh, the other professional consultants were found to have breached the, the um, requirement of uh, skill and care uh, for the reasons set out on the slide. In relation to apportionment, this was very interesting. Uh, basically, the, the contractor got off effectively scot-free because all of the um, damages were spread between the building surveyor, the architect and the fire engineer. And again, interestingly, although the fire engineer took the, the largest burden, um, the building surveyor and architect were not far behind. Um, so in the end, the contractor only ended up bearing 3% because the 3% that was um, found against the party that, that left the cigarette on the balcony, nobody enforced against him. So the contractor had to pay that. 
So um, that, that was a really interesting case in terms of, um, and, and it bears reading in, in terms of the way that the court approached um, the duties of reasonable skill and care, approached uh, why the contractor hadn't breached them, and the way in which it approached um, apportioning the liability. So, I mean, some thoughts on this case. It, it might be appealed. I'm not aware that that has happened as of yet. And as I said, prior to the case, everyone thought the building contractor would be held accountable for the highest proportion, but that actually didn't happen. The professional consultants were held to a higher standard than the building contractor, even though it was a design and build. Um, I think the, de the decision also demonstrates the limited knowledge of the risk of ACPs um, amongst building professionals um, back in 2011, that, that they were a commonly used product as ACM cladding was in England. Um, but notwithstanding this, the owners uh, were able to establish liability against the um, professionals involved. Um, and I think a number of points of comparison can be drawn in respect of this litigation and the Grenfell Tower disaster and other potential UK cases. Um, and I think issues about design responsibility, including the choice of materials, um, might well be shared, as we've seen here, between the various professionals involved. And this is one thing that was highlighted by Dame Judith Hackett in her recommendations in 2018, when she did an independent review after Grenfell. Um, and she said one of the things was to create greater clarity around the key roles involved in shaping and overseeing the procurement, design and construction of buildings and the key responsibilities and accountabilities that should flow from these roles. Because she said, you know, the, the responsibility for meeting the fire safety aspect of building regulations is something which has not been historically made clear enough in, in the um, contractual situations between the parties. So in summary, uh, what are the key questions arising or potentially arising out of cladding claims in this jurisdiction? Well, in terms of litigation going forward, I think some of the core issues are likely to be these ones. Um, compliance with B41, um, is it an absolute um, judge, to be judged by, by a test data or will it be open to argument on the grounds of, for example, safety considerations? Um, will professionals who followed approved document B or TGN 18 be held to have failed to exercise reasonable skill and care if subsequent testing shows B41 hasn't been met? Will claims under the Defective Premises Act succeed? Will cl cladding that doesn't meet B41 be found to render a building unfit for habitation? How will the courts ultimately apportion liability where claims are being made against several defendants, as we saw in the Australian case? Uh, what will be the impact of insurance claims and government schemes? Is that effectively going to sweep up the majority of claims and give a satisfactory remedy? Or are we still going to see them being litigated and coming through the courts in large numbers? Um, I think for my part, one of the most important questions is when will one of these cases actually fight and produce a judgment in this jurisdiction for me to talk about? Um, well, as the answers, I haven't got any, unfortunately. We haven't yet had a full cladding case that has gone to trial. We've had many that have come close, they have all settled. Um, so as we've seen, there has been collateral litigation on leases, on limitation, on insurance, that's already happening. It's produced some interesting law, but for the main and the key questions, well, I can only hope that by the next time I give this talk, I will have some actual answers to give to you all. And um, unless anyone's got any questions, uh, I'll leave it there.